So we're here with Alessandro Cortini. May have, hopefully you saw um, we had a little discussion on the uh, the Make Noise booth, and uh, Alessandro very kindly brought us to his place, where we're looking at some of his fantastic instruments. I mean, centerpiece here is this beautiful. Yeah, this is a, this is the grandpa in here. I think it's not probably not the oldest of the Buchla family here, but it's definitely the, the, the it's the first old one that I had the chance to adopt um, in two thousand eight. And um, it comes from Mexico, and it's been expanded over the years. The original was four boats, so from here to here. All right, so it was just yeah. This yeah, part. and uh, the the keyboard was actually at this in the spot of this um, Marf, which is the the sequence one of the sequencers. Um, with with the, with time, I expanded it, and at the beginning, I expanded it by adding the system interface, the two two seven, which it's very convenient because it allows me to record up to eight tracks at the same time, individually. So it's kind of like an I.O. mixer kind yeah, of module. Yeah, it is. I mean, it was designed for quad mostly, quad, uh, quad amplification and quad assignment of the channels and um, integration in a tape studio at the time. So it has a lot of sends, auxiliaries, and whatnot. Um, it's, a, it's a very well-designed um, end, no back end to the, to the whole thing. So it makes sense, though, you would have this to, this is going to be going out to your recording device yeah. and bringing processing sounds. Correct. And you. I, 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 don't do, I do it usually for the few sessions that I do. It might happen that we want to try and run stuff through it. But to be honest, most of these instruments that they see don't interact aside from clock. They, they, they tend to say their thing their own way, and then they come together in the session. They, right. And in the few occasions where I use more than one or two at the same time, you know. Right. For my stuff, I hardly ever have several things together. Even when I do like, now in the re recent years, I started doing a little bit of techno because it's a lot of fun for me to make. And even then, it's just one or two pieces. But I guess you get multiple voices out of this. Yeah, with this one, this well, this one, yeah, this right? one is eight oscillators. Well, it, it's four double oscillators. You know, there's three of the original 258s, and these are dual. You know, one sawtooth, one sine to sawtooth, and sawtooth, and one sine to square. And there's three of those. And then there's a complex one, which is the 259, which is a little bit um, an advanced one. It came out later, and. Um, it's that would be probably the most known boucle tone, you know, like right. the one with the wave shaper and the timber and whatnot. I mean, what's what's always interested me? I mean, I I'm really not very uh, clear on the whole West Coast synthesis thing. This is something that I have not had a chance to play with a boucle. Mm -hmm. It's it, and it, it's curious to me how because usually I, I have this joke, which is okay. So. Uh, Where's that Buchla signature sound? Show me that dance record that's got the Buchla sound that everybody... It, where, whereas the stuff that you do with it is very musical and has mm. melody and has a sonic kind of relevance sort of to quite now productions. And whereas Thank it's, you. I think generally speaking, and I am being very general, Buchlas tend to sound quite experimental yeah, or, or in the hands well, of that, experimentalists, that's how I, aren't they? That's how I... I Learn to love them. To be to be honest, at the beginning, and 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 on, honestly, when I bought my first 200D, I kind of got a little concerned because I was a little worried that I would have invested that much money in a little reactor in a box. You know, <laughs> that's how it happened to me. I started with software with a laptop, and look at where I, what happened. You yeah. know, so, um, but reactor to me was one of the best sounding environments to do stuff like that. And from Reactor, I went to the Nord Modular, the first one, right, and then to a little analog systems setup, right. And that became a bigger analog systems, and then um, I think a surge paper face uh, system from the 70s. Right. And then from there, I think I remember it was at the beginning of my tenure with Nine Inch Nails. We did a video for Hand at Feeds, and the local shop, Big City Music, Roger was the only one who at the time owned uh, one of the 200Ds that w came on the market. So we borrowed that, and I remember it was a video shoot over two days, and I. Uh, I said, I'm not going to leave it at a shoot because Roger let us yeah, sure. borrow it. I'm, so you had some, to take it home. I had to take it home. And I'm like, well, let me set it up for a second and see, you know, what the fuss is all about, if it's cool or whatnot. And I didn't go to sleep. Wow. And I just, and to the point that the day after, I even brought my sound card and I kept it under the covers of the table. So in between takes, I could record whatever would come out of the machine just to have it. And is that, I fell in love with it. I never, that, never happened with anything that's else. That's when you kind of got the West Coast thing. Uh, well, I don't know if it was then. I think there was an attraction to the way they looked and a lot of the recordings that I heard from 
Morton Subotnik just because they did feel like it was synthetic in a way, but mo very organic. Like it could have been the sound of an animal or a creature from another planet that we don't know about. And I'm not trying to get sci-fi on you, but sure. I'm just saying they had a little bit less of the, let's try to synthesize the sound of a violin or all that stuff typical yeah. of the switched on Bach period. Let's make something which that's different. It's great, yeah. but I'm not a keyboard player. I never was, and I never will be. <laughs> so it's hard for me to relate to something, to an instrument uh, whose expression um, gauge is based on the ability to play it with a keyboard. Right. Um, so enter instruments that have a lot of knobs or a touch plate that allows me to use the amount of finger that I put on it in order to be expressive. And it seemed to me that Buchla was an instrument that lent itself to that sort of approach to make music. And that's when I started seeing photos, you know, of, uh, of the first buklas from the 60s and the 70s. And you start seeing a lot of colors, a lot of weird knobs. Yeah, and they they yeah. look like toys, you know, exactly. like the easel totally looked like a toy, you know. It has a little, you know, design here, a little funny, which I also have tattooed on my wrist, unfortunately. Not fortunately, actually, because I'm very proud of it. Um, but, you know, it looks like a toy. Yeah. And uh, that's, I think, the key for me. I don't need to know what it is. I just go in front of it and... Weird stuff usually comes out. I never got, I never gotten uh, scared about the, the the way things are called, which most of the times it's different from a normal oscillator. So, do you find that you can instinctively use it now? Because I mean, obviously, this is a very yeah. complicated piece of equipment in terms of. Yeah, you know, it's. I don't think it's complicated if you if you you know one thing that I've done quite often was to concentrate on specific module. Like I would just plug the oscillator straight into the outputs and see what happens right. when I move everything. And then two of them together and see what the FM relationship is and how they sound different. If I FM the sawtooth oscillator with the square one and vice versa, what, what happens? Right. And I realized that by doing five, ten minutes, and I'm not talking about spending hours on it, but like five, ten minutes, it would allow me to get as much as I could out of one module. And then when I would be integrated with another one, it'd be so much easier. Know what you were doing. Yeah, right. it'd be much easier. So um, there's also another thing to say. A lot of the Buchla modules are uh, aware... Um, multiples. In other words, the oscillators, there's two. The gates, which is low-pass gates and, you know, amp amplifiers and low-pass filters, there's four of them. The envelopes, there's four of them. And actually, they line up to control four gates. So once you learn one, You've you kind of learn them all. You know, there's right. tricks that you can do to integrate more than one together. But overall, that's how it's designed, you know. So when you start working on an improv, this was another thing I was interested mm -hmm. in, do you have a kind of starting point in mind, or do you just kind of go, I'm, no. I'm here on the moment, I'm going to do it, and this is what Yeah, well, this is a patch that was left over from a previous session that I did, but usually I just plug in and see what happens, right. you know. And, is and this uh, running, then? Is this actually going? This, I think, is running. It's slaved from a... The clock is slaved from a... Well, let me mute all the rest. Oops. Everything is clocked to a, well, the circle on is clocking all, the whole studio right. until Logic comes in. And then if you press play in Logic, uh, inner clock sends stable clock and, and the circle on politely picks up. I said, all right, guys, you be the man. But right now we're running a sequence, I don't know how many steps, or 16 actually. But you can block it and go down to four. And is the, uh, is, the, is the CV quantized on this as well, so it makes it easier no. to kind of hit? So no, you'll have to tune it. You've got to dial it. Right. You have to tune it. There's no quantization. I remember there was a trick I read about. It. I remember Suzanne Shani was using this in her system to quantize the outputs of the 246, but I never, I mean, it never had to be done live. I never had to use this live, so I can take the time to tune it. Yeah, you wouldn't really want to move this around too much, would you? No, I played one show with it once, but it's not worth the hassle. Yeah. And plus, you know, there's one thing that I learned which I'm very grateful for is the fact that once you, uh, I personally think that once you, uh, like for example, I have no idea why now we're hearing sounds still, but here we go. Once you learn to, or once you start working with an instrument, um, a lot of the way that you approach the instrument just because you've been able to work on it will translate to other things, even software. Right. So I find myself being able to um, achieve um, sonic, um, you know, nuances or sonic you know statements that would be achievable in the book club but with a plug-in simply because i kind of know what i can achieve from that so i strive to find it it might not be the exact same thing okay yeah I see but what but i'm able techniques but and the, yeah, and the, it, yeah it's more like oh wow i didn't know that you could do this sound how did i do that sound and then in, uh, subconsciously you sort of apply the same thing to other things you know and that, that's sort of like why i like working with different instruments and concentrate as much as i can on one um 
a, a lot of the times I get the impression that people think that the things that I do, I do just because I'm able to have instruments that others don't, you know. Right. And uh, it's it's not true, you know. I just no. Uh, I mean, because the, there's the uh, other album that you just did with the MC202. Yeah, know, that's one of my like... that's my favorite instruments. The 202 is probably one of the shittiest as far as build quality yeah. and you know. And now they're becoming expensive we'll again. Just go over to this area yeah. while we're here. But so yeah, the, I mean that was um... well. There are two things about the 202 that I found unique. And, and very cool. One, obviously, is the fact that the sound source is very similar to the 101, which is a very well, well known and great sounding mm. synthesizer. But the sequencer is one of the best things ever. But the whole record uh, was built by just mashing like that and then just going back to, you know, cycling it and ah, then okay. going back to, to, uh, to play mode and cycling the, the piece, you know what I mean? Now it's following a clock, so it just started automatically. But, um, I would come up with something that I liked, and then it would go through delays and a delay yeah, and a reverb. So, so this, what, what kind of stuff were you using to process that? Uh, that I was some... using a, uh, a way huge superpass delay, right. which has it's an analog delay with subdivisions, right. and a timeline Strymon. Right, okay. I believe I might have used also a, a Blue Sky because it's probably my favorite. There was reverb. some drive there as well. It sounded like, or was that just uh, kind that, of blowing up? That's the room a lot of the times. You know, the fact that I was recording with a little Zoom H2N. And uh, and I, I sometimes and most of the time it wasn't be recorded direct. Right. So it, just... I would record the um, the little. I had a Bose boombox, like one of the small <laughs> Bluetooth ones or whatever, yeah. you know, which is one which sounds amazing, you know, tiny. But it's very convenient to bring in hotel rooms because you can just listen to music without having to connect anything. And I started running that, and I would leave these sessions, you know, these sequences running. And sometimes I'd be taking a bath, you know, and listening to it, and like, fuck, I'd be cool if I could just record this. And I was like. I can, so I would take my you know zoom with me, not not quite in the bathtub, but kind of leave it there, and then it would get also the water sound, you know what I mean, and stuff. Very like ambient. That. Yeah, literally. But yeah. Uh, and then there was a little bit of uh, post in the studio, but not much. You know, it was mostly just to try to enhance that sort of sound. You know, a lot some of the stuff I ran through the I recorded on cassette and then right. passed it back, very very hot on cassette, so it get a little bit overblown. Uh, okay, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I kind of I'm attached to that sound because I you know. I grew up making cassettes, you know, for myself or for friends, and just getting so much into the songs that you just overdrive the input and it sounds like shit. But you're like, I don't care because it sounds so good. It, well, it gives yeah. adrenaline, doesn't it? It's got a sort of yeah. And you know, at the time you don't think about it, but I don't think it. I mean, it's arguable if it sounds good or not. But to me, it's just something I grew up with. So it's right. just a sound that uh, makes me feel happy. <laughs> I mean, there's no other way to describe it, really. And we've got a whole bunch of other goodies here. So you've got, you know, you've got yeah, old and new. Stuff. You know, the electron stuff is always on and always getting some uh, action, particularly the Octatrack, which is uh, to me. And people say, "What? Well, that's a little exaggerated." I think it's probably one of the most revolutionary instruments of the last twenty years. I think it's. Uh, I've never been a sampling guy, and the Octatrack changed the way that I approach sampling. And even the simplest sound bite can be transformed into a song. It's one of the the most creative instruments I've ever had a chance. It's very to hard. I mean, not hard. It, it's deep, and it takes some time. Well, to get I your think head the right. drawback, you know, I said something very good about it. I can tell you what's the bad about it. The bad was that it was released with a system that wasn't ready for prime time, in my opinion. So when I borrowed it first, it was unusable for how I wanted to use it. Once uh, the system got implemented with all the features that it needed to have, then it became much easier to use. And uh, although even after I say that, it's a very com not complex, but awkwardly structured. Right. Um, that said, I've, I've used it. Actually, I was just talking to Richard Devine the other night about it and said, man, I can't believe I'm still using that like it was yesterday. You know, I could sit on it and do a record just with the Octatrack. But and so when you're doing, when you perform, I mean, it's, you perform very much in the moment, I'm guessing. Yeah. Do you then kind of cut and paste and take bits and or do you try and keep a linearity? I try to keep linearity. And so it's a compromise between, it, it depends really what I'm doing. If it's work for somebody else or it's commercial work, then... Yeah, it's, a I, I, it's a different approach, but if I'm if I'm working on my own uh, creative output, then I try to to squeeze as much out of one session, uh, trying to be as interesting as I can for my own sake, not you know to please myself as possible, and and finding a compromise between the take and the lack of per perfection, because you know I make mistakes and I sometimes I most of the time I leave them there, right? Just because I like that sort of sense that okay well it's a human doing this in the end it's a human control it's very interesting i mean and i think it's a it's a, an approach that really does yield good results and it's interesting also because a, a lot of your stuff has 
and I'd say this in a, in a good way, a kind of pop sense, a pop melodic sensibility, which is really unusual for experimental composition style. Yeah, that's my parent. I grew up listening to the Beatles, so it's right. one of those things like they fed me that in a, and so in a good way. I'm very happy, and so I've, I've always I've always been attached to melody. I've done I've done stuff that is a little less melodic, which I'm I'm, I'm just as attached to. Mm. But percentage-wise, I'd say 90% of the time I come up with melodic stuff. And, and I tend to come up with melodies that make me happy, and that's yeah. why I repeat them forever. There's definitely an emo <laughs> but there's an, it, there's a, you can hear that there's like an emotional sequence without getting too hippie about it. You can, yeah, no, I, a, I agree a, with you. A, you yeah. know. I've done some noise stuff. Uh, mostly, actually, I use the synthy for stuff like that. Right, so now, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of workflow, which I think you are. For me, that looks like a really difficult place to use those it's, instruments. Well, uh, the down here? No, I like to sit down and, and come make stuff down here, actually. So it's oh, okay. very, it's very, like, my, actually, the synth, probably the, the AKS is my favorite out of the two, although the, the VCS is very cool to record straight without having to, to sorry, straight by, from the speakers as opposed to, you know, recording it well, from a... Well, anything that's in a suitcase, I'm happy with. Does it make a quite a big difference having a relationship with, with, with the keyboard? Because obviously the yeah. VCS... Uh, well, mine is cover and cat fur, so it's unique sounding. <laughs> but yeah, definitely. I think the keyboard adds a layer of... of, uh, of uh, of control to the instrument that you wouldn't have otherwise. I mean, right now I have no idea what this patch is. I should have prepared stuff to look like I know what I'm doing, but I figured <laughs> people should know that I, you know, that I don't really know, and I just play around with knobs all day. We're basically sending the sequencer to the to oscillator number one. Right. Okay. And then the scaling is a little off though, which is which I don't understand why shouldn't be that much off but see that's what happens sometimes you turn it on and you realize oh wait it's so i'm guessing one. with all of this stuff you must have a pretty uh, hot tech available to sort of fix yeah i'm lucky i have this uh, gentleman here in la called michael boomer who saves my ass on several occasions but it's never like anything major aside from the other day i burnt my 2600 by plugging the keyboard which i don't know how i could do it maybe it's my you know my gym shaped body that made it happen <laughs> i um uh, I plugged the keyboard reverse, so I burnt it all, and on, on, I wasn't happy with that. So I also see, see I also see the LED or the uh, the light being a little dim. And I'm like, hmm, that's not. Oh. It's a little dim, but it's not. Whoa, I wonder what. Let me see if it makes sound. So I left it on for a while oh, so until it just really yeah, then yeah. It to I just smell. you know, if I'm gonna break it, yeah. I'm gonna break it. It's not. You know, not just leave a half. These, are, I mean, these strike me as being actually quite uh, West Coast in concept as well, because they're very scientific and experimental. Yeah, Would definitely. You agree with that? Oh, for sure. I mean, this is. But see, this sounds so good, like right out of the box. It. And go. it's stereo, you know, you can just sequence or sequence, you can voltage control the panning. This one is, I think its strength is this, it's the keyboard. I think the keyboard is definitely, you know, the thing that makes it, makes it special. Right. Um, obviously the sound, it sounds amazing, but um, so like... See, it's never regular, it's kind of weird. Yeah. Like you have to be in a specific... See, I told you Frank would always come. When he hears this, Frank is like, what's going on? He's got a special cat. Yeah, Frank loves this, but... And then I'm bringing another one. I'm bringing another oscillator, and then you have... This one too. See what's in this. It 
it's interesting. I mean, the, the, the sequencing is almost, it's like a sort of trigger mod almost, rather than no necessarily no in this instance. Yeah, you can, and then you can, you know, control whatever. You know, channel one is your keyboard, so this becomes the control of one of the oscillator if you want it to be. Oh, so you can sort of just take the sequence, let the sequence run, and then add. The problem or good thing about it is that every stage at seven is clean, but once you go over seven, it will overdrive. Right. So. <laughs> crackly, crackle. Yeah. Cracklewood, I think we'll say. <laughs> Instead of cracklewood. <laughs> Yeah, so this is uh, one of my latest loves. Yeah, I can't say I blame myself. I've, I've always wanted one of those. It's a fun, it's a a fun instrument, and I think out of all the compact ones, definitely the most fun.